afternoon this afternoon. Grab that gold hymn book in front of you, hymn 565. 565, I will sing the wondrous story. Stand with me as we sing. 565, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Let's sing it out. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. found me. Sing it out. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Sing, so sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died. 
died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. Verse 4 as the last, sing it. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrow's path I often tread, but the Savior still is with me, by His hand I'm safely led. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous song. Welcome back to Bethel Baptist Church tonight. Pastor is gone and yet you returned. Amen. So he said he was going to have a guest speaker tonight too. I'm still waiting for them to show up. I thought it was Brother Gilligan, but he said it was not him. So if he doesn't show up, Russell and Patrick and Sam and DJ are up for popcorn preaching tonight. Amen. So Amen. no, there is no guest speaker tonight. You get me again. So Amen. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you're glad to be here. But let's go ahead and pray. Ask the Lord to bless our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we do again thank you for such a wonderful day. We thank you for a, a good morning that you gave us this yes. morning with Sunday school and, and church and just everyone that was here. Lord, we thank you for the starting point class we had just a little bit ago and for those that were here as well. What a blessing it was. Now we just ask that you'd be with us here tonight at church, Lord, that you would just be honored by our singing and lifting up your name and by the preaching here in just a little bit as well, that it would bring glory to you and it would encourage and edify uh, your children that are here tonight, Lord. We ask that in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stay standing. Turn in your songbooks to hymn 572. 572, in my heart there rings a melody. 572 on that first verse now. I have a song that Jesus gave me, it was sent from heaven above, there never was a sweeter melody, tis the melody of love, in my heart there. Calvary, sing about it. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within our trumpet players down here sweat a little as I keep holding that out there. <laughs> 562 now. I'm on the winning side. You guys sound wonderful from up here, by the way. 562. I'm on the winning side. 562 on that first verse now. Once I drifted out in sin, 
If you have not received a bulletin yet this month, our ushers will be happy to give you one. I announced this morning we were running a special today. They are free of charge. That's still good tonight. If you have not received a bulletin, uh, just slip your hand up. They'll be happy to give that to you as they're handing it out. Remember, teenagers, this Saturday, 4 o'clock, parents from about 4 o'clock till 7 p.m. This Saturday will be our teenage activity down on the farm. If you need a ride, let me know. Uh, it is $7 per teenager. We are otherwise planning on meeting at Brother Joe DeClue's house. I'll get you an address here by Wednesday if you need to know where you're going. But it'll be a fun time. We're going to have some fun games, some fun fellowship, and some obviously good food. But that'll be this coming Saturday. Uh, also Saturday at 10 o'clock, if you can be here, we'll be going out for soul winning uh, for door-to-door -door visitation. I believe we had another one saved yesterday. or Rick, Rick said he thinks so anyway. The door was partly closed and he couldn't hear everything they were saying. But it was a good visit. Got to give them the gospel. Amen. And we're going to go where they got saved. Amen. So that's several weeks in a row now we have seen someone try 
trust the Lord. And it's just because people are faithful going out, uh, knocking on doors, giving the gospel. So that'll be at 10 o'clock in the morning. The 21st is our ladies' tea time and crafts. I know Mrs. Waterhouse is excited about that. I hope, ladies, you are too. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously you cannot ask her tonight because she is not here. But feel free to call her, text her, email at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. She will not mind as I get all those transferred to me, and I will happy be happy to answer those. But no, sign up. If you have a question, please ask her about it, but I know it'll be a good time for you. And then our Harvest Festival has been moved to Saturday the 28th. It'll be that afternoon, I believe he said at 4 o'clock from about 4 to 6, maybe 4 to 10. We're not sure yet. <laughs> It'll just be a fun family time, lots of candy, lots of food, and lots of fellowship again. So please be here if you can. And then on November 5th, that morning, is our church's 24th anniversary. All right? Make sure you're here. All right? Yes. Make sure you're here. It's, it's a special day. Don't go out. You wouldn't. I would say you wouldn't go out fishing on your wedding anniversary, but... <clears throat> Guilty. But she said I could go. I celebrated the morning with her. I mean, we had been married three years, I think. She was, it was fine. Went fishing. Had a great time. No, it's our church's anniversary. If you could be here, be here for the anniversary. All right. I know it's a special day. It'll be a special time. Find someone and bring them with you. And then that evening, kind of just to finish off our, our 24th anniversary and to finish off, the as I said this morning, the back stretch of our relay race we've been doing. And we actually get a have a time of, of rest and relaxation. We're going to do it at pastor's house. Yeah. Make sure you bring some chairs. Make sure you bring a probably a sweater or a jacket because it will be hopefully a lot cooler by then. But we'll have our Sunday evening service at his house for our annual Smokies and S'mores. We'll have hot dogs and s'more makings and some games and a bonfire and lots of people just gathered around the fire talking, having fun, sharing some testimonies, probably a short devotion. We'll just see how the evening goes. Uh, Pastor gets to plan all that and head it all up. And I know he loves it. And I think most everyone that goes loves it as well. So please mark these dates down. Plan on coming and being there. It'll be a blessing to you. But it is our time for offerings. So ushers, if you'll make your way forward. Pastor, on a serious note, and then to a non-serious note right after, because we want you to smile for the offering. He said he was thinking about getting a guest speaker just to help break things up and to make it easier on me. But then he said... No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to let you do it. So I was like, okay, but I'm still having a love offering for the guest speaker. So, <laughs> and that's what he did. He laughed too and then never said yes. So, so no love offering tonight. But again, now that you're smiling and you're in a good mood, Brother Tony, would you ask the Lord to bless our offering?
situations he's not the master of is anything too hard for God only believe trust his word you'll see his plans are now unfolding performing perfectly it's clear Amen. Brother Munoz has been a blessing since he has been here. So it's been, I think we've broken him in pretty good too, but it's been a blessing having him here. I know filling in for Pastor and Caleb filling in a little bit for Brother Munoz this morning. So I'm thankful for our musicians, for everyone that does stuff. If you do anything around the church, I am thankful for you. So, and I think other people are thank you as well. But thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being here. If you have your Bibles, turn to Malachi. No, the pastor, just because he's gone, I am not preaching on tithing and giving and saying everything he wants you to know while he's not here. I'm saving that one for him, but I am partly in Malachi because the last Wednesday he was gone with some of you fellows, I preached on a couple verses out of a passage, and then he came back Sunday and preached on that same passage, and I think did a much better job, but still preached on it. And I was talking to him and I said something. He's, oh yeah, I just read that passage too. And his I was outlining it like crazy. And I'm thinking, great, I'm not doing that one because he's going to come back and preach that next Sunday. So I'm going to do a different one. But I'm not going to tell you what it is because when he preaches it, I don't want you to know. It's going to be a surprise. But he's like, yeah, I, I've, I just read that too. And he's, I was making outline. I highlighted and outlined that thing like crazy. So I'm just looking forward to see when he gets to it what he's going to preach on out of it. But if, you have, if you're there, Malachi chapter 2, I'm going to read, get to my notes so I know what I'm reading. Amen. But the first nine verses is what we're going to, to read tonight. But Malachi chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings, Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do, ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my commandment might be with Levi, or I'm sorry, that my commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn away many from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord. But ye departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this evening. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be up here. I just ask that you would use me, that 
you would not, again, just speak to the hearts of the people, but that you would speak to my heart, Lord, and give me what I need tonight as well. Be with Pastor and his wife and Brother Gary as he's bringing them back, that they would just arrive safely. Lord, we're looking forward to having him back in his place this Wednesday night. We just ask that you continue to bless. Bless he and his family. Lord, bless this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I was, I was doing my Bible reading, and I read that verse in, uh, in verse... Seven, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And in verse 8, it says, But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And I know a lot of people, well, you're talking in Malachi. You're, talk, you're talking about Old Testament priests. Yes, I am talking about the Old Testament priests and the position and the job that they had. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe the Bible, and I'll get there at the end, but the Bible in the New Testament calls us as his children a priest as well. So that is what he calls us. That is what he classifies us as, as his children. For those that know him as Savior, he says, ye are a royal priesthood. Um, hello, that makes you a royal priest in the eyes of God. You have the same access to him that the Old Testament priest had in the Old Testament. So a little Double emphasis is on Old Testament. Amen, just in case you're not listening. But in the Old Testament, God used prophets to carry a message. He, he used them to carry a message to certain individuals. He used it to carry messages to kings. I think I'd rather take it to the individual than the king, because you really have to have some bravery to go before the king, because he went, yeah, I don't like that, just off with his head, right? But he took, they took messages to kings. They took messages to whole nations, just to proclaim the message that God had given them for that, that particular instance. Many times it was a message of judgment, but they were, he sent them with other messages as well. But that was the prophet's job. And Malachi, he's one of these prophets. He's in what we call the minor prophets. Again, not because he wasn't as important. Every prophet, every message that God has put in his word is just as important as the one before or the one after it. Again, it's, just, it's called a minor prophet because of the length of the book. So a little bit of some Bible knowledge for you there. It's just because of the length of the book. His name simply means messenger. That's what Malachi means. It just simply means messenger. We don't really know anything else about him as a person except his name, and he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. That's most all we know about him. But we do know that he had a message for Malachi. And if that's all we knew, if we didn't know his name, if we didn't know his time frame, it wouldn't matter because really what matters is the message that he delivered that God told him to take. That is the important part that we see. Whenever someone comes and says, thus saith the Lord, oh great, brother so-and-so is preaching tonight, brother Munoz, we got to go hear him preach. I don't know, I never heard of them, it could be a bust. I don't know, so he might be a big name preacher, he might be a known name preacher. But if he's giving, thus saith the Lord, guess what? That's the message that God wants you to hear tonight, and that's what's important. It may not be delivered with all the alliteration and all the stories and all the hoopla that some people give. It might be dry and monotone and stands here and reads it like some of the old time Puritans did with the dry red eyes, dry <laughs> clear eyes. But if that's the message God has you under, that's the message God wants you to hear. That was the important part, was the message that came from God that he was to deliver. And he was giving it to God's people, in this case, because of their wickedness. We also see that in this chapter, he single-handedly points out the priest. He says, this is my commandment unto you, priest. It's like when I talk to my kids, I get onto them as a whole, and then I single out the one and say, I'm talking to you. Or on the, on the athletic team. I did a no-no one day in a, in a basketball game. And at halftime, our coach said, I don't want to hear you say one more negative word about the refs. Do you understand? Everyone was like, yes, sir. Well, we went out, played the second half, and the ref did an even more atrocious job. Coach was not around. And I walked by and I said, why don't you learn how to ref? And kept going. I mean, I was, I was ticked, but no, no excuse to be disrespectful. Coach gets into the locker room and says, Larry, what did I say? I looked at him square in the eye and said, you said you didn't want to hear us say another word, and you didn't. <laughs> and he just went, 
That's what he said. And that's how I took it. But he said, Larry? He singled me out right in front of all the team. Larry? I'm like, what? <laughs> Malachi says, oh, priest, this is my commandment to you. He says, I am talking to you directly. He says, this message right now is directly to you. The priest's responsibility was to go to God on behalf of the people. They were supposed to offer the sacrifices for their sin. They had a pretty important job in the Old Testament. They offered the blood sacrifices that represented the innocent lamb of Jesus Christ who was one day going to be slain. They had an important job, I would say. And he says, because this is your job, because you're coming into my holy of holies, because you're coming into my temple, he says, I expect you to be holy. I expect you to be clean. But that's not what they were. They were also supposed to teach the people what God's word said so that they as a people could live a pure and holy life. That is a grave responsibility placed on someone. The priest, because of their position, they should have lived a holy life. You know, we as a Christian, because of our position in Christ, we should live a holy life. They should have known the difference between the unholy and the holy. And as you read the, the books of the prophets, some major prophets, some minor prophets, you'll see scattered throughout there that where he's, the Lord says, My priest, they have made no difference between the holy and unholy, between the clean and unclean. It's they've made no difference between it. You'll find it scattered all throughout the prophets that many times they called out the priest and said, look, this is what you're doing wrong. That is what Malachi is doing here. The priests, they should have known how to live a life that pleases God. But Malachi, like the other prophets before him, some even during his time, he singled them out with a message about their sin and what God thought about it. And I, we were talking in starting point class uh, just this evening. It doesn't matter. Uh, a kid says, well, I didn't do a big sin. Mom said, don't have a cookie, but I still had one anyway. Well, guess what? Disobedience and thievery is still wicked and vile in, in God's eyes. Amen. Well, I didn't do anything major. Yeah, you committed a wicked, vile sin. I ate a cookie. No, you stole and you disobeyed. Maybe even you rebelled. That is wicked and that is vile. He says, this is to you, priest. I want you to listen up. And because as a child of God, as a royal priesthood, I believe it is for us as well. But we look at the priest that Malachi is talking to, and if you go back to chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, we see their waywardness. The priests weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They, they got out of the way. They were doing something else. And the Bible says in verse 6, in Malachi chapter 1, it says, "...a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master." If if then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord? Or saith the Lord of hosts. O priest that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor." Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? We see their waywardness. They were not doing what God told them to do. It's, they dishonored, or they despised God and his name. They said, we're going to do something else. And God says, a child should give honor to his father. He says, am I not a father? Where's my honor? Should we not be highly valuing God as our father? But yet he told the priest, he says, you're not honoring me. You're not holding me up in, in high esteem. He says a servant should render to his master. Again, he asks, am I not a master? Am I, am I not your God? Where, where is the, the serving me? Where is doing what I've asked? How about a citizen? A citizen should pay to his king. Verse 14, the Bible says, But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. It's, it's, if, if earthly people, if we're supposed to pay our king, how much more should we not be in debt to our king, the great king, the king of kings? He's like, I think you're missing something here. This is what Malachi, is. It's your, your, you've left something out, and I'm trying to tell you what it is. It's you've despised the name of God. And they said, how? How have we despised <laughs> I think of kids. You did such and such. You dis How did I disobey? 
show you how you disobeyed. You want me to spell it out for you? But eight times as you read through the, through the book of Malachi, he'll say something and the response of the people, how have we done that? Wherein have we robbed God? How have we despised your name? How have we done this? I mean, God points it out. How have we done that? A little, little arrogant attitude. How have we despised your name? How have we despised God's name? And I can kind of see Malachi getting a little red, not from blushing, but from wanting to, you know, just grab them by the neck and wring it, but holding it back, the anger building up. What do you mean, how have you despised his name? Let, let's just stop and look at what you're doing. So he says, fine, how have you despised his name? How about verses 7 and 8? You've offered polluted bread and maimed animals. And what were these sacrifices for? Where was it located? It was in the temple. It was for the, it was for the blood sacrifices for the people's sin. It was representing Jesus Christ. He's, you're offering polluted bread and maimed animals. If it was a picture of the perfect, spotless, innocent Lamb of God, and they're offering bad sacrifices... How is that a, a, a picture of who he is? Are they saying, well, this is who, God's, who God is. He's, he's corrupt. He's not who he says he is. He's the innocent lamb of God. And he was, he was, had every right to be mad with his priest. That, you're not representing who I am. You're not picturing who I am to the people. Remember, the people are looking to you as the priest who are coming because they don't just get to come into the temple and do this. They don't get to come pay for their sin. They don't get to come offer the sacrifices. It's they're coming to you who I have designated for this job, and you're not representing me. It's you're despising my name. It's these offering and sacrifices. They're the picture of the Lamb of God. They were allowing people to offer less than their best. I haven't always been the best dad when it comes to my kids in sports because I am very super competitive. I left and I have aches and body not working right now because of that competitiveness. I still hurt from it. But when it came to sports, and that's how I was, if you're going to play, play. No half-heartedness. And I learned when I played half-hearted, I got injured more than when I did wholeheartedly. I don't know why, but I just did. But if you're going to do something, do your best. And I don't know how many times I've yelled at my kids, play or get off the court. Let someone on that wants to. Right? Maybe not the time to say it. But I'm super competitive. If you're going to do it, do it. If we're going to go out on that football field and play flag football, by George, you better tackle that person and tack, get the flag so you can say, I got the flag. Because again, my philosophy, if you can't beat them, beat them. Make them regret winning. All right? That's how I played sports. That's how I play checkers. You can't do that. Don't do I don't care if it was right or I'll smack your hand. I'm going to win at all expense because I want to win. God says, if you're going to do something for me, you shouldn't offer me less than your best. If we're offering something to God, don't give him our trash. I mean, in verse 8, he says, take it to your governor. <laughs> See if he's pleased with you with that. You take him the maimed and the crippled and the diseased. Say, here, O king, look, O governor, look what we brought you. And tell me how pleased he is with you. He's like, he's not going to be pleased with you. Why do you think I would be pleased with you? I'm not pleased with you giving me something that even another person wouldn't be pleased with. And we've moved places, and I, I'm thankful for people when they fill your pantry, when, when you move somewhere. But... When they do it with the stuff that they haven't eaten in a year and it right. expired six months before that year was up, and you're like, oh, it's, it's 2005 and this is from 2003. You want mac and cheese tonight? Right. <laughs> I mean, if you're not going to eat it because it's sold, why are you offering it to someone else? Right. God says, if, if it's not good enough to give to your mom or your wife, or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, or whoever is special to you, maybe you're having the governor over. If it's not good enough to offer them... Why are you offering it to me? I mean, he is far better. Our offerings to God are an indication of what is in our heart. Amen. I mean, it's a picture of what's really in our heart. If this is what I'm offering him, and it's not good, then maybe my view of God is not what it ought to be. Maybe my view of self and everything else is out of whack, and it's above God. 
but they despised his name. Verse 14, there was a, the deceitful were cursed. He, sa he says, but cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth, sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. In other words, they had what was required for the sacrifice, but they said, that's my only good one. I'm going to give him this one instead. It'll be okay, Brother Munoz, it'll be okay. No, God said offer you that one. Why? Because that's the male, that's the yearling, that's the one without spot, that's the one without blemish. Yeah, but that's, that's going to be my, my, my breeding ram right there. I need that one. This one only has a, a couple spots and a broken hoof. He says, you're not deceiving. You might be deceiving people. You might be allowing this to go on, but he says, you're not deceiving me, and it's cursed. No, it's, it's not going to be accepted. It's already rejected before you've even, you've even offered it. They, off, they sacrificed a corrupt thing while having a good thing to give it. And God says, I am a great king. All caps on the great and the, on the K. It's capitalized. It is talking about God. He says, I am a great king. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. He says, I am the great king. And you're offering me that? I've already cursed it. We see their waywardness. Secondly, we see the warning that was given to him in chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And now, O ye priest, this commandment is for you. You've, I think most of us in here have probably been singled out. I've been taken out for barbecue a couple times since Pastor has been here. What, what was he saying? Brother Tenen, this is for you. <laughs> and he wasn't talking about the food. I had a few other pastors I've worked for. One called me in, and it was pretty much, all right, listen up. I'm like, oh, this is for me. <laughs> Making sure no one else is there. He says, listen, I'm talking to you. I've done it with my kids. I'm talking to you. I've done it with our teenagers. I'm talking to you. Malachi says, this is all, again, back to the LTV, the Larry Tennant version. I thought about using the, my good wife version, the, the MGWV, but that one, my good wife version, she's out there laughing at me now. But I thought of that this afternoon. I, I, I study real hard at home watching football and doing things right. My good wife will tell me what it's supposed to say. <laughs> but, but the warning, they despise the privilege of even being a priest. He says, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the people. I'm not talking to the false prophets. I'm not talking to the kings. I'm talking to you, priests. I am calling you out. I'm pinpointing you right in front of everyone. Now listen up. They took for granted the calling God had given for them. Instead of doing what they were supposed to be doing, they were using it as an opportunity to please themselves. They were using it as an opportunity to put the people into subjection. In other words, serving God at the altar became a job instead of a ministry. And you know, that's easy to do, whether you be, whether you be a pastor, or whether you be a Sunday school teacher, whether you be an usher, whether you be a nursery worker. Right. It becomes a job rather than a ministry, right. if you're not careful. He says, this is what you've done with your position this was supposed to be a prime position that everybody wanted. But now you're treating it as a job. He says, I selected you to minister. I selected you to be here and serve. But now it's just a job to you. And it's showing. When it becomes just a job, it does show. They despise the privilege. And the decree was given by God. He says, listen and listen well. You ever said that to your kids? You listen. I mean, sometimes... You grab them by the collar and you listen, and you listen well. Grab their head. You understand? Good. Are you listening? I've done it. I've, I've shaken their head yes, and I've shaken it no. I'm like, you don't understand? Let me explain it again. Do you understand now? I, I kind of picture, this is what Malachi is wanting to do to the priest. Do you understand? Yeah, good, good. We're getting somewhere now. Because he says, listen, and listen well. And then sometimes with kids, you got to be like, okay, go clean your room. What did I, okay, okay, what did I say? Go clean my room. 
good and make your bed. Oh, okay, okay. What did I say? And make my bed. Yes. And then come to me for further instructions. What did I say? And come to you for further instructions. Do you understand? 15 minutes later, they never come to you. Well, their room's half clean. Amen. The bed, it looks like they took all night to make it. Where's this kid at? Doing something else. Did you forget something? No. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I did. What did you forget? And I've gotten that look. And not just from one, from several. And not just my kids, but multiple kids that aren't even mine. Like on a bus, at church, all kinds of places. Huh? Yeah, we already forgot. God says, listen and listen well. In other words, he says, you better lay it to heart. When God says you better lay it to heart, you better lay it to heart. He says, my covenant with you was one of life and peace. He says, when I selected Levi of the tribe of Aaron, the son of Aaron, when I selected that tribe to be my priest, to represent you to me, the people of Israel to me, my covenant with him was one of life and peace. That was my covenant. It says Israel was to be a peculiar nation. It was supposed to be a family of priests, thus the family of Levi set apart for the service of God. He says that was my covenant with you as priest. But you've despised me. So we see, we see the warning and lastly we see their way in verses 6 through 9. It says the law of truth was in his mouth. This is again speaking about Levi and the tribe and the covenant that God made with him as the priest. He says the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. And he walked, he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. Is that not our job as a believer? To give the gospel? Or as it says in Jude, pulling, saving some, pulling them out of the fire, just making a difference in one life, Amen. just turning one from their sin back to Jesus Christ. That's what God wants us to do. Give the gospel and live in a way where people will hear it so that they might be turned from their sin, from their iniquity. But verse 7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Who are we? Well, according to the Bible, we are the messengers of the Lord. We're His children. We are His messengers. But verse 8 says, But ye are departed out of the way. The way was a way of righteousness. Truth was in His mouth. Iniquity was not found in His lips. He walked with the Lord in peace and equity. And He turned many away from iniquity. I think even back in, in the wilderness, where the sons of the priests and, and their job, they ran to stop the plague. And the Bible says he stood between the living and the dead. Think about how many he just saved and turned from the punishment of their iniquity because he ran and stood there. But it was a way of righteousness. But the way was renounced. They turned from it. They put it aside. The priests were a messenger of the Lord. Our lips should be full of knowledge. When we talk, it should be the truth. People, when, we're, when we talk to people, whether it be other Christians or whether it be the lost, they should know, oh, they're talking. You need to listen. Why? Because he's speaking the truth. Well, how do you know? I don't really know, but I know him, and I've not known him to lie about important stuff. So if he's talking, you probably need to listen. He says, their mouth that was full of truth. And they sought the law. People sought the law at their mouths. They came to them to, under, to know what they were supposed to do. He says, but it was renounced. They, they turned from the way. He said, yeah, we know that's the way, but we want to go this way. Their way was ruined. The Bible says they were made contemptible. In verse 9, it says, Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. You want to be made base and contemptible in God's eyes? Then turn from the way that He's told you to live. 
Go do your own thing. The Bible says, in other words, is they're going to ignore you. They're going, oh, it's just the priest. Oh, it's just them again. Great, what are they going to lie about us today? What are they going to lie about today? What are they going to try and connive out of me today? Great, it's just the priest. Right? Don't you feel that way sometimes about Christians? Oh, great, there's another Christian. What's he going to lie about today? Another Christian car salesman. I'm glad Brian's not here right now. <laughs> Why is it always the car salesman? <laughs> yeah, that Christian, he ripped me off on that car. Then he has the, the nerve to ask me to go to church. And he won't even help me with the car that he ripped me off on. It's always the car salesman. I don't know why, but it is. That's not Brian. But it's just the car salesman thing. Okay, So if you're watching, Brian, I'm not saying it's you. It's just the car salesman. But they had no influence. He said, you're not going to have the influence you used to have. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness and who is marvelous light. First Peter is not talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to God's children. It says, ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a royal priesthood. What the priests were supposed to be and do in the Old Testament is what God says we're to do in the New Testament. And I know, oh, we're supposed to go off our blood sack? No. Do you understand what I'm saying? Good, let's clarify. No, we don't offer blood sacrifices. We're pointing them to the sacrifice of the innocent Lamb of God who died for us on the cross. Amen. He offered the blood sacrifice. Our job is just now simply point them to Him. That is our job. What the priests in the Old Testament were supposed to do. Point people to God. Point to people, point people to Christ and what he was supposed to do. Why? Because as a child of God, he says, I am a royal priesthood. I am in that family of priests. I don't have to go to the Pope. I don't have to go to some priest at another church. I don't even have to go to the pastor of our church to confess my sins. I can go to God and God directly, God alone, and say, Lord, I have sinned against you. Would you forgive me? Now, if I've done something, I need to go to the pastor or whoever. But I don't have to confess my sin to them because I can go to God. I have the access that the priest had because as a child of God, I am in the priesthood. I have that direct access and so do you. That's, that's why we need to go to him. We're a peculiar people, or we're supposed to be. And that word peculiar, we're not supposed to be weird and funny. We're supposed to be peculiar. We're supposed to be different from the world. Many who proclaim to be a Christian are Christian in name only. These priests in the Old Testament, they were no better than the people who had turned their backs on God. They lived a lifestyle that disgraced God. It was a life of defilement. And yet many people who proclaim the name of Christ, they live a life of defilement. Whether, whether it be what we call gross sin or little sins, they're living a life of sin. They're not doing what God has asked them to do. Many might just be lukewarm. They're not sold out completely. They're not set apart completely for honoring God. And maybe they haven't separated holy and unholy in their life. But it's okay because I'm going to church. I'm teaching a class. That, I'm teaching a Sunday school class. Or I'm teaching a junior church. But then you go home and you watch your vampire movies and you read your demonic books and you do all this other stuff that God says you shouldn't even be glorying in that. But that's their form of entertainment. They watch their movies full of cuss, cuss words. They listen to their songs full of cuss words and families being torn apart. But it's okay. I teach a Sunday school class and I read my Bible and I go soul winning on Saturdays. But God says, it's like you're offering me the maimed and the crippled. You're saying one thing over here and doing it something else on the other side. You're not giving me your best. Like God told the priest in Malachi, he says, I've made you contemptible and base. I believe that's what he said to many Christians as well. I've made you contemptible and I've made you base. In other words, you've lost the influence I wanted you to have. And it's your fault because you've turned out of the way. You've gone your own way. We're not as holy as a whole. I think we've got some pretty good people in our church, some more holy than other people. And I wish I could say I was in the more holy part, but I'm not always in the more holy part. Ask my wife and kids. I'm probably more down in the, yeah, I need to work on it section. That's where I'm at. 
And that's why my influence isn't always where it ought to be. But is that where you're at? And if it is, guess what? We can change that. We can. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will favor you. I will, I will put favor upon you, and other people will know it. But he says, you've got to come out from among them and be ye separate. Does that mean I can't read my demonic books and, and watch all my vampire and demon movies and Friday the 13th and all these scary Halloween movies coming up? Do those honor the Lord? Right. No, they don't. So why are we watching them? And then going to work or school and telling everyone about, oh man, I stayed up watching night and watched all the Friday the 13th and Jason's and Freddy Krueger's. It was great. My kids were sitting there sweating and screaming all night. Ta-da! What is to brag about that stuff? I know Halloween is coming up, and that's probably why I'm picking on it. But we shouldn't be participating in that stuff. Amen. I mean, it's a no-no. We sing the song with our kids. Jesus says, no, no, don't do it. But yet... I'm the pastor. I'm the parent. I'm the Sunday school teacher. I can handle it. Thank you, Samson. Tell me how that turns out for you. 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 15, it says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Conversation is your lifestyle. It's not just your speech. It's your lifestyle. God does care about your lifestyle. Be ye holy in your lifestyle. That's what he is saying in all manner of conversation. Well, what do you mean? It means if it's part of your life, be holy in it. Well, even, yes, even that. What, yes, that. E, yes, that. You didn't even let me say even. I know, but it's part of your life. So yes, be holy in that area too. There should be no but, ands, ifs, or buts about it. Be holy in all manner of conversation. Period. That's what it says. We do not have the influence as Christians once did. Hopefully our church has the influence. I mean, we can be different from the rest of Christianity because we're different people. But the rest of Christianity can hurt our influence. Oh, you're one of those. No, I'm not one of those. And let me prove it to you. I will show you I am not like them. And that's what people are looking for. Oh, you are different. You're not like the rat. No, I'm not. Do I sin like them? Yes. Will I make you mad? Yes. Will I fall? Yes. But am I trying to do my best and bring honor to my God? Yes. And they will see it. They will see the difference. And God will use us to turn many from their iniquity. He's either going to use us to help turn them from their iniquity, or he's going to look at it and say, I could have used you, but I couldn't. And therefore, you didn't turn any from their iniquity. How are we doing in our Christian life? We are the priests. We are the children of God. We are the messengers of the Lord. Because His child, we should know His word. And that is His message to this lost and dying world. One, are we faithful at giving it out? And two, does our life match up with it? Because the world will see right through you. If a kid can see through you, the world will see through you. And if they don't match up, they're not going to listen. Your life has to match the message you're giving. And if we're giving a message of peace and hope, then our life needs to match that God is the great king. If I can get every head bowed, every eye closed. Again, I don't know. You could be here tonight not knowing heaven is your home. Tonight could be that night. If that's you, say, I'm not sure heaven is my home. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? I'll pray for you. For God to be your great king, you have to make him your king. Say, that's not me. That's me. I'm not sure heaven is my home. Anyone at all? I see your hands. So maybe tonight, where do you fall? Or would you fall in the classification? You're living for God. You're doing the best you can. Or is there an area in your life you know you really need to work on? My hand goes up in that one. There's things I really got to work on. I think we all fall in that area. As good as we think we might be, we're, we haven't arrived yet. As the piano plays, if you want to go ahead and stand, if the Lord's spoken to your heart, why not maybe take care of it tonight and leave it at the altar? Maybe it's just recommitting yourself to the Lord, saying, Lord, I haven't done this, but I don't want to get there either. Would you help me to stay faithful to you?
but maybe there is something we need to get rid of. Lord, I want to leave this here. I'm, I'm leaving it at the altar. Lord, I want to please you. And I want you to use me to turn many from their iniquity. In other words, use me to see people saved. That's what God wants, to see people saved. up here. Thank you for being here tonight. Again, I know sometimes when the pastor's away, people, hey, that's a good time to miss as well. So pastor, thanks you for being here as well. I know he would be encouraged by your faithfulness. I have not gotten received any secret text saying they're late or behind or anything. So Lord willing, Gary is flying down 55 or 21 as we speak, trying to get here to get their kids, which they haven't seen in a few days. So Lord willing, they arrive safely. Uh, be back Wednesday. Pastor will be here. Be back next Sunday. Okay. He wasn't here. Make sure you're back next Sunday so you can hear him. But continue to pray for Mrs. Waterhouse. I know her sister passed away a couple weeks ago and it was unexpected, but the funeral the memorial service, whichever one you want to call it, was yesterday, and now it's kind of like settled forever. She, There is no more, I'm going to see her at the funeral, I'm going to do it. She is no longer, obviously, in this world, now there's the recovery of her and her family. So just pray for her that she will be fine, that the Lord will comfort her, and that the Lord will use us as a church to comfort her as well. Amen. Amen. And just throwing that out there to help comfort her, lady, sign up for the activity. All right. It might be the time God uses you to bring some comfort to her life during this time. So, but thank you for being here. If you see trash around you, maybe pick it up a little bit. Help our janitors out as they pick up your toenails and fingernails. Uh, ew, it's real though. It happens. So maybe pick up your mess and have a